today we'll be looking at some of the things that have caused us aches and pains in this country. The security challenge. It's such that someone said most Nigerians can hardly sleep with their eyes closed. Is it a concern for the leadership as it is a concern for the lead? There are four elements that seem to be working against us as a people. Some say it's a structural problem. Some say it's a geopolitical problem. Others say it's a legal problem. And some say, actually, it's a human problem. Whatever you think might be the reasons behind the security challenge that there is, it is not something that anybody wants or is enjoying at the moment. And everyone is screaming for a solution. We heard about the kidnappings that took place in Kaduna. Over 200 students kidnapped. Fortunately and thankfully, they have been released or rescued, as the case may be. Thanks to the government of Kaduna State and the security agencies and the military that all worked together to see that it happened. But how many more will be kidnapped before a solution is found? Some say it's a problem of accountability and others say it's a problem of key performance indicators. Others are also concerned about the structural framework around the security agencies. All of this, are those the problems? Newsnight sat down for a conversation with Dr. Kabiru Adamo, the Chief Executive Officer of Beacon Securities and Intelligence Limited. He talks to us about the effects of structural issues, non-state armed groups, geopolitical elements, as things that are happening outside the shores of Nigeria, and the effects of natural occurrences, like the pandemic, for instance. This and many other things he talked about in a moment. Dr. Kabiru Adamu, CEO, Beacon Securities and Intelligence Limited. Thank you for speaking with us on Newsnight. Okay. Um, Nigeria, our countries, and indeed the West African subregion, and maybe some parts of Africa, are faced with enormous security challenges at the moment. But yours is an intelligence agency in security as well. So what would you say you've been able to glean in this, this situation that we have? Uh, we have a unit that is focused specifically on intelligence. And what it does is to try to identify the threat elements that exist within the environment uh, that we operate in so in Nigeria and then, of course, in the Sahel region. And then try to now interpret what those threats present to us, um, the risk that we could encounter as a result of those threats. So we know, for example, that there are structural issues within our country, Nigeria, that in themselves are creating threat elements. We also know that there are the existence of what we've generalized as non-state armed groups. Now, these are groups that are outside the state. They are not constitutionally created groups that have uh, resorted to the bearing of weapons and that are challenging the supremacy of the use of force by the state. And then thirdly, you have geopolitical elements, the developments that are happening outside Nigeria that are now impacting security mm. in Nigeria. And then, of course, you have the last set, which are the natural um, occurrences. As an example, uh, COVID-19, when it happened, and then more recently, some of the more um, you know um, diseases that have impacted uh, security as it, as it were in Nigeria. So a combination of all of these four things, uh, what we have monitored over time as impacting security in Nigeria. If we start with the structural issues, there is a lot of grievances within Nigeria. There is no part of Nigeria you go to that you don't find one or the other form of either political, social, or economic grievance. And this is driving insecurity ac across the country. Now, so, uh, let's stay with that structural um, issues that you talked about. Is that what's causing the recent increase in kidnappings across the country? Uh, so uh, the threat uh, of kidnapping is associated with at least two of those elements, or you could even extend it to three. So yes, uh, this possible uh, socioeconomic grievances is or a trigger of that type of kidnapping. But more importantly, the ability of the threat element to have access to weap weapons. And we believe that a significant percentage of that weapon is coming from across the border. So that's the geopolitical element. Um, there are developments in Sudan at the moment. Yeah. Then a few years back, Libya, 
uh, of course, and then of course the coup in Niger. All of this have led to pathways that have emerged that have allowed these non-state armed groups to have access to weaponry, and not just to weaponry, to ammunition as well, because they are able to use those weapons, they are able to uh, use the weapon with the ammunition they have access to, with no concern that the ammunition will finish, mm. uh, because they know they are going to get more of those am ammunition. So it's a combination of both socioeconomic. If we focus on the socioeconomic grievances, the current uh, dire economic challenge within the country has opened up the echo space where these non-state armed groups operate. So people are out of jobs because companies have, you know, um, closed, closed up and a lot of people are now out of job. In the past, where it was more, it was difficult for them to get informants. Now it's very easy because people need money. Uh, in the past, where it was difficult for them, as an example, to get foil for their uh, motorcycles, now there are lot, lots of people that will be happy to get those foils for them and then they pay them little money, uh, you know, as commission. And, and several other components of that, even the money they collect through our banking system, in the past it would be a little bit difficult. But now it's easier because more people are wanting to benefit from that ecosystem that allows the kidnap for ransom industry. So it's a combination of several factors mm. that is, um, you know, leading the kidnap for ransom industry to uh, expand as it were at the moment. Okay. We so the combination of different um, elements or factors leading to this, there was a time in Nigeria when it was as though kidnapping was the talk of the town in the Niger Delta, in the southeastern part. This um, kind of news wasn't heard in the northern part, but it now looks as if the, it shifted to the north. Is it the same issues that were driving the same factors driving what was that we knew before are they the same factors now is it say, structural issues that are driving that or socioeconomic issues that are driving this situation right now? um the same factors but their manifestations are different in the niger delta it was agitation for resource control yeah, at that time the main targets were persons associated with the oil industry so either workers in the oil industry or anyone who had some form of um, you know, uh, involvement within that oil industry. With time, we saw a metamorphosis of that challenge into now wealthy people and politically exposed persons. But um, I can't remember the exact year. There was a period where we now saw, call it a handshake between those criminal groups um, in the Niger Delta with the criminal groups in the northern part of the country. And it's possible that the security arrangement that was put in place in Niger Delta made it a little bit difficult for them to target and abduct persons. So what they did was they started looking at the north. Um, at that time, we would see operations planned in the Niger Delta, and then they will now involve um, northern criminal groups to carry out the operation. The negotiation will be done by the criminal groups in the Niger Delta. And then with time, the groups in the north also realize, hey, we're just getting peanuts from these operations that we get ourselves involved in. So they themselves also started getting involved in the operations themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's how uh, we now saw the emergence of these sets of criminal gangs within the north. But that's just one element. There are other elements. Mm. Don't forget that apart from uh, the purely criminal groups that exist in the north, there are also the bandit groups mm -hmm. who are organized and who, uh, to an extent, are trying to achieve a social objective. So they also are engaged in abduction. Then there are also the terroristic groups, the ideological terrorist groups like the Jamaat al 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 Dawati wal Jihad and the um, Islamic State in West Africa province. They are also involved in abduction. So all of these combinations are... Uh, that's why I say it's the same issue, structural um, to an extent, but then the manifestation is different. Mm -hmm. Okay, so right now, what about the political element in all of this? We'll still come back to, the, in all of these things, we talked about structural issues. We talked about socioeconomic grievances. But what about the political side? Because there, there, there are a lot of people who will tell you that it's the politicians that use these young people for elections, but they are not able to take care of them anymore. And they just say, go. And those ones are looking for survival. So why then would the, even these the politicians that use them, they now sit back and look, uh, these guys are total strangers. So, um, yeah, there is a political element in all of this too. But I, I just relying on that political um, explanation, I would say it's simplistic. We need to look a little bit beyond that. Earlier on, I spoke about the eco space 
that allows the non-state armed groups to recruit from. Now, in that echo space are these gangs that politicians use. Um, anyone who is in doubt about the involvement of non-state actors within the Nigerian security space, you just need to wait for election periods during the campaigns. Just go to any campaign rally and see the layers of security. There will be at least two or three layers of non-state armed groups that are providing security to politicians. So it is a fact that politicians do engage these gangs, sometimes arm them as layers of protection for them. And then immediately after the election, now where that particular politician wins the election, he has more influence, is able to engage these non-state armed groups in different forms. But where he loses the election, or the political party that is um, dominant in that particular space loses the election, then that almost that set, complete set of non-state armed groups are now left jobless. And that is where, when earlier on, when I said the echo space that allows these non-state armed groups to operate, they are able to now recruit from that particular gang that are now jobless, as it were. They are, they are offering their service to the highest bidder, as it were. So that's one of the ways through which this political um, you know, patronage or involvement with gangs allows crime to fester in Nigeria. But there are also several other ways. There are instances where not all politicians, but some of them actively actually use security either to um, achieve an outcome or in certain instances to sabotage the government. Now, you recall that uh, from February to March, there was an election. And then, of course, all, all, all the way from that March up until around August or September, there was the election petition tri tribunal. Now, depending on the, whether it was presidential or at the subnational level, the tribunal lasted a little bit longer. So at the end of that tribunal, there are grievances that were um, inherited from that process. And some of, some of those aggrieved persons um, accepted their fate and let it be. Others now decided to use security to achieve an objective. So that's also another element. So we could, we would be right to say then that besides the structural situation, such economic um, grievances, should. there's also political grievances. De definitely. And so is it is it right then, would it be right then to say that some of these challenges, security challenges we're having now may actually be acts of sabotage? So definitely. Um, definitely. And um, it's been indicated by um, some, uh, in fact, not too long ago, the State Security Service issued a warning to certain politicians. Now, what worries us is that when such warnings are issued and arrests are not made, it's as good as um, they are adding uh, the, the, the foil to the flame that is already burning. Mm. Nigerians are already uh, discomforted by the fact that the security challenge has reached a peak. And so when you issue such warning, knowing that there are politicians that from an intelligence point of view, you've been able to gather evidence that they are uh, using security to achieve an objective. What we would have expected is to arrest those politicians. But I think um, the history of Nigeria has shown that that doesn't really happen, sadly. Mm. Uh, warnings are usually issued and arrests of that type. So why do you think th those arrests never happen? Because we keep hearing the state institutions issuing warnings, putting out statements, some very strongly worded statements. But no arrest is made, or even when arrests are made, prosecution is never, never complete. So the first part, why arrests are never made, um, two reasons. First off, um, politics is a very um, intricate thing in Nigeria. Uh, sometimes the identity of the politicians um, does not just lie with them personally. It represents two of the most tr um, tricky things in Nigeria, which is religion and um, and ethnicity. So arresting them, uh, separating their personal identity from their religious and sometimes their ethnic identity is a little bit difficult for the government in power. It can be done, no doubt. Uh, and the best way to do that is to present evidence in a manner that would be indisputable so that even if somebody wants to defend them, it would be a little bit difficult. But we're not very good in, in doing that. So to avoid the controversies that will follow their arrest, I think most governments um, shy away from from, from doing that. Uh, as an example, um, there are certain persons who, uh, even if they are guilty as charged, once they are arrested, the fact that they are representing the political uh, party, as it were, and not just that political party, but also representing a religious and an ethnic identity, it will be a little bit difficult mm. to now separate uh, their action 
from the you know that position they are occupying and so that's why i think most government now the second element where that you asked why we, we don't see pro prosecution um even where ar arrests are made it's a function of first the criminal justice system that is defective in Nigeria. It is ineffective. It is in inefficient. Um, you as a journalist, I would urge you to go to our law enforcement agents. They don't have evidence rooms, most of them. And it is so sad that President Buhari realized that if you go back to his 2015 speech um, during his inauguration, he promised, realizing that this law enforcement agents don't have evidence room that he was going to build evidence rooms in them but most of them till date in 2024 don't have evidence room so how do you hope to prosecute uh, some a suspect when you cannot even gather the evidence to present in a competent court of jurisdiction to support the charge that you have against him the evidences are tempered you know this i mean every scene of an incident when i watch it on tv or sometimes if i have the fortune of being there i see how the evidence is being tempered with so it's almost impossible really to prosecute the person when you cannot preserve the evidence so you know you just said something here that paints um a picture of our security infrastructure in itself is not built for gathering of evidence. That's what you are alluding to. At least our law enforcement agents, agents. Um, I mean, starting from the most basic, which is the police. I urge you go to most of our police formations and ask them to show you their evidence room. Mm -hmm. You'll be shocked. Very few would have evidence room, and even where they have the evidence room, the required material to preserve the evidence is almost not in existence. And don't forget, that's just the first part. What of the issue of corruption within the system that allows for the tempering of the integrity of the evidence? Mm. Uh, one of our most famous police officers had been accused of tempering with evidence that was collected from suspects. So it, it's a fact, apart from the physical infrastructure that is required for the preserving of those evidence, the materials that and the processes that would secure the integrity of those evidence is also not in place. So, so what then do, what kind of trainings then, or what kind of curriculum have, are we running in our training institutions for the security um, agents and all of that to, is that not thought about? Is that not part of the training that is received or is it just more theoretical than practical? So it goes more than that. Uh, yes, there are issues with the training. Um, I can bet you that a lot of the training curriculum and the training itself um, is not uh, concurrent with our current challenges. These are training curriculums that were built several years ago and no one has taken time to actually review them and make them amenable to our current disposition. So it's, it, it's this issue of non-preservation of evidence, it goes beyond training. It, it has to do more with the standard operating procedures that have been built into the processes of our law enforcement agents. I mean, Evans, all of us are aware of the case of Evans. Um, I'm sure you saw the picture of the policemen who gathered all the phones that they saw in the vicinity where they arrested Evans and took pictures with, with those, um, you know, phones, allowing him and whoever wanted to defend him to see the evidence, of course, tempering with the evidence in that process. And then so many abuses. When the Kaduna train incident happened, you saw how uh, person upon person's VIPs will visit that location. It was never cordoned off. It was, it took time. I think almost two, three days after the incident before someone thought of cordoning it off. When the Kujay incident happened, you saw how VIPs visited there. Nobody thought of cordoning it off to preserve the evidence. The VIPs themselves, are, are they even aware that there's evidence that they're tampering with? So, and, and that, that, that also brings us to the role of our law enforcement agents. Why are they not, why don't they have the confidence to take charge when issues like that happen? You, I, I haven't, I have never been in a situation where any law enforcement agent, irrespective of his position, uh, in terms of security sector leadership, that would remind any political office holder that this environment is, a, is an evidence environment. Allow us to finish our work before you can come. It never happens. Mm. Um, I mean, the most recent Kuriga, when the abduction happened in Kaduna, they visited, they tempered with the evidence. Nobody took time to even debrief, as simple as debriefing some of the persons who witnesses and who even participated in the process. Too. Is it possible that it was done and not made public? No, no, it was not, it was not done. I know this. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you definitely know a lot more than, than we are. So what then are we doing? 
When we say we're trying to overcome the insecurity challenge in the country, we're working. When we hear rhetorics like government is doing everything in its power to deal with the insecurity situation, government is doing everything in its power to prosecute those who have been accused of financing terrorism or have been alleged to be, to be part of these, any form of insecurity challenge as, as the case may be. What are we doing? Um, I think we're pandering to the politics of it. And okay, that's, so, yeah, okay. a lot of it is um, to attain or achieve some political objective. That's number one. Uh, there, it, it would be unfair to say that we have not prioritized security. I think uh, there is no government, at least in the last, um, I would say, 12 years, that has not attempted to prioritize security. But what they have done is to actually prioritize the politics of security, the real security. The, the core of the technical aspect that I am a, a, a player in, I haven't seen it prioritized. And what mm. do I mean by that? Security has become increasingly technical. And the best way to achieve your objectives in the implementation of especially national security is to follow it like a project. So in other words, introduce um, accountability systems. Ensure, for instance, that you have monitoring and evaluation components within the security space so that when you ta when you give responsibility, let's use a minister as an example. Now there are 29 MDAs in security, ministries, departments, and agencies in security, and um, each of them has a mandate. I don't want us to, uh, to, 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 to kid ourselves around that. They all have their mandates. So it's very easy to use that mandate to measure their performance. As an example, the one that have primary responsibility for internal security is the police. If you ask me to develop key performance indicators for the police, which, by the way, I'm, I'm participating in, we know the responsibility of the police. Mm. We know, for instance, that they are supposed to bring down abduction. If the abduction rate and the monthly abduction rate is about 700, the key performance indicators would, very simple, bring it down to 100. And at the beginning of the month, when you are presenting your budget, give me what you need to bring it down to 100. Mm. I give you what, what, what you need, and then you give me time. You say, okay, in three months, in six months, I'll be able to bring, bring it down. And then, of course, at the end of that period, I measure you. And that's missing at the moment within the security space, that type of measuring of performance to allow us to know whether progress is being made is, is missing. And what is the principal reason why it's missing? Metrics. There is, I would say, a morbid fear for the adop adoption of metrics within the security space. And because of that, we are unable to measure their, their, their performances. Um, whenever they are, they are engaging either at the, the very high level, which is the National Security Council, I would love a situation where the president will ask them to present metrics, uh, where the president will be able to compare from the time he appointed them. Um, let's say it was in August 2023. Now in say uh, March or April 2024, what have you been able to do in terms of reduction of numbers? The same thing with the military and then, of course, all the other 29 MDs. Unfortunately, that, that is missing. So when you ask me, for instance, yes, we've prioritized security, but we're not measuring security. What we're seeing is a sinkhole where money is being um, put, put into, into security, but performances, sadly, are not commensurate with those money. That and quite a lot of money has gone into this. A lot. Moment. So what makes you think that the, the, that fear of adopting metrics, at least to measure the extent of impact, for instance, why is that fear there? Um, for simple reasons, because it's, it would show non-performance. And once it's the non-performance is visible, that office holder may likely lose his job. Okay, so let, let's pull back again. Back to something you said earlier about prioritizing politics, but actually politicizing it, so to speak. Can that be done away with? Yes, it can. But um, at what cost? Exactly. And I, I think at the point where the politicians realize that without an improvement in security, uh, it will be very difficult for history to be fair to them. Um, no matter what they're able to achieve, if they do not achieve an improvement in security. And I think that is something we need to um, drum down every political office holder. Mm. Uh, the moment they realize that, and the moment that the people we start emphasizing the need to improve on security so that we actually hold our leaders accountable in this area of security, then maybe we'll see a change in that regard. And again, I want to emphasize that governments have prioritized security. 
uh, if there is no government that lives in the last 12 years, like I've mentioned, that hasn't proper prioritized security. But sadly, well, like I said earlier on, what we've seen is the politicization of security and not necessarily the making security effective. Mm. And the only way we can make security effective is to measure performance within the security. So one of the things you said earlier, and I, I, I would, if I can put it all in, prioritizing security. But so far, what's been prioritized is more or less the politics of it. And as someone will say, you can't talk politics without talking about where the money is going. But again, and some other people have said, if you want to catch the criminals, follow the okay. money. So politics, criminals have one thing in common, money. Is it possible that our security apparatus is missing this link? Um, I wouldn't say they're missing the link. Uh, um, we've been fortunate. Uh, we're part of um, a committee of nations. So at the global level, you have the UN. The UN has several uh, conventions, charters that it has released on financing terrorism and some of the other cr organized crime. In fact, we have a UN um, office on organized crime. I've forgotten the, full, the acronym of it, but there's a UN agency that is active in Nigeria that is supporting us in fighting Organized crime. Then at the regional level, you have ECOWAS, and ECOWAS has GERBA. Mm -hmm. GERBA does a peer to peer review, um, periodically. The last review it did for Nigeria, it released a very, um, detailed report where it identified our risk in terms of financing of terrorism and several other components. And, um, the interesting thing, which is what kind of worries me, um, the responsibility, the risk it identified exist almost 75% of it in our financial institutions, not the non-organized um, sector. So which means if we can, if we're going to reduce the financing of terrorism and some of the other criminal elements, just by improving our financial sector, we can reduce it by 75%. So I was a little bit worried when recently the government released the names of persons and I went through and I did not see anyone in the financial sector. Mm. Most of them were private individuals. I also I was also a little bit worried. If you pick the Terrorism Prevention and Prohibition Act, I think 2021, as amended, it was very clear on the process of declaring anyone uh, either a ter terrorist or supporter of terrorism or involvement in terrorism. The process that says um, only the Attorney General of the Federation working with the Sanctions Committee, which is a committee made of, of several um, government departments, can now receive any petition and then have a competent court of jurisdiction declare that that person is or that company or that corporation is terroristic or is, has supported terrorism. Now, when that name was released by NFMIU, we were not told whether that we went through the process. Went yeah. through the process. And then and there, more, were, there were reactions to Exactly. That. And, and one of the reactions actually confirmed what I'm just saying, that the case was still in court, which means they had, they, they had not waited for the process to be completed before declaring those names. One would think that such cases should not even spend more than a day in court. So it takes us back to our criminal justice system that I spoke about earlier on. The fact that the, all the elements within our criminal justice system have challenges. It's also part of the structural issues why we have security challenges. If um, the determination of a terrorist uh, sponsor will take a very long period to the extent that the government department will be so frustrated as to now go out and release names without waiting for the completion, then something is definitely wrong. Mm. Yeah. So point I'm trying to make is the processes and the principles that are the required for monitoring financial transactions. We have them in place, no doubt about it. Uh, from the CBN, uh, the yeah. regulatory body, to offices like um, the NFIU, to EFCC, to ICPC, we all have that, that the platform, the capability. The challenge, however, is in the implementation of the processes. And then, of course, for the regulatory bodies to carry out their work the way they are supposed to. The banking sector is, is a huge vulnerability. Till date, over 70% of the workforce of the banking sector are still, um, you know, a contract staff uh, whose loyalty, frankly, it's, um, nobody is, is, yeah. is sure of. And because of the circumstances they are exposed to, their pay is very low, uh, welfare is almost as good as um, non-existent. Non non so it's very easy for a criminal 
uh, element anywhere to, to come and them. influence them and, and, and buy them. So that vulnerability, just like Gerba mentioned in its um, risk uh, report on Nigeria, unfortunately, we've not blocked. A lot of effort has been made, and I must say that NFIU is working hard. Um, the CBN is also so, working So hard. let me interrupt you here. So NFIU is working hard. The CBN is doing its own bit. But what are the banks that are mostly private-owned? What are they doing in line with this to um, ensure that these over 70% of staff that are contract? They're, they're essentially profit-oriented. The, the compulsion for them to correct these things will not be there as long as it's going to affect their profit. So that's something we need to admit. And because of the criticality of the banking sector on our economy, mm. um, the central bank is also mindful of the consequence of such, certain actions on the bank. So, but what worries me is that every year, the banks declare stupendous profits. Indeed. So I think the regulatory bodies should have to step up and make sure that the banking sector does what it's supposed to do to reduce those vulnerability. Now, it's, gonna, it's not going to happen in one year. I don't want to keep us around that. It will take time. But the processes that will allow us to correct the process, I think it's, it, we need to start. Perhaps develop a, a roadmap to say, okay, reduce from that 70%, reduce it to, let's say, 50, then from 50 down to 25, like that, until we reduce it to a negligible um, percentage. Mm. You know, interesting that we're, we're, we're kind of like going back again to where we started from, follow the money. Now, there's, as far as Nigeria is concerned, even though we're a cash-based society, there is no how bulk sums can move without anybody noticing. It's but impossible. Yet it's happening. And I mean, I just got a mail yesterday to go and link my name, otherwise my accounts will be restricted. But I thought that we had um, the National Identity Management Commission that had our data and we work with the banks to see all of that. Link. Do Sim I seamlessly? Seamlessly. So at the end of the day, why do I need to go and do that linking if the government is really interested in curbing this? Um, I mean, I can understand some of the uh, privacy issues involved there. So maybe, yes, there is a need for you to go and authorize your bank to, to carry that process. Maybe let's give them the benefit of the doubt. But what, what worries me actually is the fact that in terms of density of the persons that have been up, um, uploaded in the database, for, of NIMSI, I think at, we're still at probably 50%. Mm. Only about 100 million persons have been registered. So, so up till now, more than 100 million uh, have are yet to be registered. So even if we follow through this process, it means there is 100 million persons. And what would even shock you is the vulnerable population, I'm using this word now loosely, but I'm trying to say that the population that are uh, uh, al alleged to be most responsible for some of the criminal uh, activities that are occurring in Nigeria, we are not even focusing on them. Earlier on, we spoke about the youth gangs, the, no the nomadic group that are primarily responsible for the banditry that exists in Nigeria. A significant percentage of them, if not a hundred percent of them, have not been registered under the system. And it is only recently through a World Bank funded pro pro program that we decided to start um, focusing on that particular group. And that program has not even started. Mm. So point I'm trying to make is, um, even if they register all of us and we link our uh, name to our BVNs, there would still be uh, up to 100 million. What about the phone people. lines? At, at one time, that was like a major, it was all over the nation. You need to, if you're not registered, you don't register your line with your name, you can't use it. That's not working till now as well? Uh, it's the same thing I'm trying to explain. Because if a hundred million Nigerians are outside that platform, then imagine even if you do a hundred percent of all the BVNs, all the need, need, need you that, that have you have, million. you still have a hundred million. We have more than a hundred million telephone lines registered, even though some of some of you have like five, ten lines. Some of you, I'm <laughs> sure, not me. <laughs> you know, so again, that matter of data and the operational ability of our security apparatus. Where is that link? Is it even being utilized? So let, let me talk freely and let me start by commending President Bola Ahmed Tinubu for moving NIMSI to the Minister of Interior. It was a strategic move and a lot of us have applauded that move. At least now it's in its right place where there, there will be a linkage between the activities of NIMSI 
with the principal uh, agencies that are responsible for internal security, although the police is still outside the Ministry of Interior. But mm -hmm. I'm hoping that there will be a handshake between the Ministry of Police Affairs and the Ministry of Interior so that what the NIMC is doing and the police can also be aligned together. But having said that, if you, what worries some of us, and in the past we attempted to highlight this, but it's not being listened to. Uh, cyberspace is as important or even more important than the physical space and security at the moment. And so where you have the managers of our cyberspace completely outside our security sector, as the case is now at the moment, then it means we have a gaping hole that we are not looking at. Mm. And what am I trying to say? Um, the entire infrastructure upon which our cyber, cyberspace lies is being managed by the Ministry of um, um, I think Digital Communication now. And that ministry has, at the moment, no linkage within our security sector. In other words, it is not recognized by the security agencies as a security department. It's not invited during meetings that have to do with security. The argument is that a lot of the security departments have components of the cyber uh, capabilities. But from the infrastructure, from the point of view of the criticality of the cyberspace to our national security, um, we, we at the moment do not have any outlook that looks at, at that because NCC and the Ministry of um, Communications is outside the security system. Mm. So I, 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 when do we get, do you think we're likely to see that coming together? I don't think it's going to happen with the current mindset that we have within the security sector leadership. They don't and probably will never see uh, the Ministry of Communication as a security department. They still see physical security as the only form of security, but modern security has moved beyond physical security. In fact, we're right now in the world, we're talking of convergence between physical security and cyber security. And for anyone who is in doubt, just take your, yourself a few days back when that cable was caught. Mm. The consequence it had on our national security, yeah. to the extent that the Minister of I think, Digital Communication said he was speaking with Ghana and a few other countries to see how they can protect that cable. So physical security and cyber security are now together. Let me give you another example. Our president visits um, a particular country. He's in a hotel and then his team goes to do a survey of that hotel and they clear that hotel. But they don't go with a cyber expert who now tells them that the lift that the president is going to use is connected to the cyberspace. And then a criminal des decides to hijack that lift while the president is inside, a mm -hmm. cyber criminal. So convergence between physical security and cyber security has already taken place. The earlier we decide to have a cyber foothold within our national security defense, the better. It kind of answers your question. The reason why we are not seeing enough traction in the monitoring of our cyberspace, including communication, is because of the lens with which we're looking at security. We're still looking at it from the physical point of view. That cyber eye, most of them, um, the leadership at the moment, don't see it um, the way they see it. But interestingly, if you pick our National Security Strategy 2019 as revised, it's mentioned there, actually. Mm. It is mentioned there. Mm. You know you know why I laugh? Nigeria is not... Does, there's no death of laws and policies and documents in Nigeria. Nigeria has some of the most um, thought out, um, well written and worded documents and policies and laws. But when it comes to actionable parts of those policies and laws. And definitely. And so that, that takes us back to the issue I brought up earlier on, the need for accountability within the security sector, introducing m and &E monitoring and evaluation, it will solve this problem. If we strengthen the m &E component within the security sector, within so the executive arm, or all the security departments are within the security arm, and all of them, interestingly, do have m and &E sections. They have the standards, the military, if you go, they have the standards department, or whatever they want to call it. Then they also have m and &E units at the defense headquarters. Mm. So all we need to do is to strengthen these departments, ensure that we have capable hands with those departments, and empower them. Now, what they will do is every time we have a policy, they will develop key performance indicators. And then we can now measure the, the implementation of those KPIs. Now, but how, how do you think this will work in a system where the CEO is Lord? Um, that's, that's the kind of system we Lord. We have, we, I mean, in, in sociology, we'll talk about Nigeria having a patriarchal system. 
So the whoever is the head or the boss is Lord. His word is bond. So how can this happen? I, I think that is being gradually uh, broken down. Um, the democracy that we've embraced has reduced that uh, patriarchal system that we have in place. It's not as autocratic as it used to be. Leadership now has some elements of accountability. All we need to do is in, improve that accountability by enhancing this M&E component that I, I, I spoke about. If we don't enhance the M&E component, then unfortunately we would have these leader, leaders that are not accountable to, mm. to us. But we've not discussed the role of the parliament in all of this. Yes. Now, because we have a check uh, and balance system, where the executive fails to do this, like I've recommended, then it is the responsibility of the National Assembly to now, through its oversight function, ensure that the national, the executive arm does this. And because sadly, the legislative arm is not doing that, that's why we are where we are today. So I would also urge the fourth estate of the realm, which is, <laughs> which, which is, which is journalists to perhaps pressure the National Assembly to reach a point where it does Increase its oversight you function. Know, and 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 this, the, we, everybody <laughs> tends to always come around to pressuring the fourth estate of the realm to pressure the executive or the National Assembly. <laughs> I, again, I wonder to what extent? Um, it can work. It can work. I'm, I'm very certain it, it can yeah. work. What makes you think a man who is benefiting from tearing down a building would want? to change the process so that he cannot tell that. We need we need, we, we need to real we need to make that man realize that when the building is torn down, he himself would be affected. I don't think parliamentarians at the moment realize that they are seeing what happened in Niger. They are seeing what happened in Burkina Faso, what happened in Mali. In all of these countries security was cited as the reason. Now the first arm of government that is affected when those things happen in the parliament. So the earlier they realize that, that it is self-preservation for them, the better for them and the better for us. And I think that is where the Scott Fort arm of the realm needs to continue to drum it into their ears. They have a responsibility for as long as we're practicing a democracy, they have a responsibility to carry out their oversight function in a manner that ensures the, sec the executive arm of government does its work. At the moment, we were a little bit shocked when they gave a clean bill of health to the security sector after their interaction. Mm. Um, that wasn't what uh, most democratic countries do. Yes, no doubt, because the APC is in a majority within the parliament, you can give a clean bill of health, but you should also follow up with, uh, with comments to say this is what we expect you to do in social period. When, it's, when you just give a clean bill of health, it means, hey, everything is fine. Carry on the way you are. But everybody, everybody in Nigeria knows everything is not fine. You know, uh, and as we begin to wind down, there's, we've talked about what needs to be done to rebuild our security architecture. I mean, you alluded to a mindset, um, a reorientation, a restructuring, so to speak. We've not talked about state police, and honestly, there's no time. But let's look at the news, the biggest news that happened, I mean, this in this um, weekend, be, or this past weekend, be the return of the school children. Yeah, um, it's, it's good news. We are happy uh, the kids spent 16 days. Uh, I mean, we have a situation where uh, a, a, one of the uh, ab 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 victims of the abduction, which happened in 2015 or 2016, sure. is, still in, is still in the hands of the abductors. Yeah, sure. Uh, Leah, Leah Sharibu. Uh, so yeah, this is good news. Um, happening just 16 days after the abduction and they are released. Uh, we're told by both the state government and the military that it's a combination of um, military uh, force, uh, the role of um, you know the society, uh, eminent persons within the society, the community. And then, of course, um, we we're also told that perhaps one or two influential individuals may have played a role in, in that regard. So that's commendable. What is missing, however, is the absence of a framework that would um, ensure uh, this doesn't happen again. And even if it happens, that this is the roadmap to follow to ensure that there is no disjointed action. Because right now we're hearing different news. Um, as an example, the governor used the word relief. Uh, the military used the word rescue. And so that's a contradiction, really. And I, I think it's a failure of communication by within the government 
Um, so they need to harmonize their strategic communication components so that this type of inconsistency doesn't happen. But more importantly, we need a framework for addressing the challenge itself. What is the challenge? Banditry. I had the good fortunes of listening to the, a voice note shared by the person who did the abduction. And surprisingly, even though in his very weird uh, ideology and thinking, he has a reason for what he did. And in my world, if someone says he has a reason, you solve the problem. So I think government needs to listen to that reason and find a way to neutralize that reason. Um, that framework would help us in doing, in doing that. Uh, Vanda, what, should, what do you think should be done for those children who have been traumatized? Um, so, so Not just them. Their family, their families, their classmates, indeed their entire community is traumatized. We missed it. Um, what, one of the first things we should have done was to set up um, an emergency center. This is simple 101 in dealing with emergency crisis. We missed it in that regard. We did not set up a center. And so if we had set up the center, one of the things the centers would have done was to collate the names of the parents, collate their challenges. And then part of the recommendations of that center was to offer psychosocial support to both the families and then, of course, to the victims and to the community as a whole, because frankly, they've been traumatized. Um, so we missed it in that regard. It's not too late. Uh, we can, we can, we, we can no longer set up the center because the issue has been quote and unquote resolved. Mm. So one of the simplest things we can do is to find perhaps, um, a medical center within the community and then see if we could, um, deploy one or two, um, you know, experts in the offering of psychosocial support that would now offer it to both the pupils and then their parents. But more importantly, we need to go back and improve protection within our schools. In 2021, we launched the national policy on safety, security, um, and security and violent free schools in Nigeria. We are yet to implement that policy. We need to go back and implement that policy fully so that we have schools that are, that are safe. No, no bandit should be able to come to our schools and abduct kids in the manner that these kids were abducted 8 a.m. in the morning. No bandit should be able to do that. And on a final note, what about state police? Would that help me resolve all of this matter? Not in, the, not in the current circumstances that we have. If we do create any institution with the current circumstances the that... kind of curriculum that they have? Apart from the curriculum, with the absence of accountability within the system, that institution too will suffer the fate of all the federal institutions. So let's introduce accountability. Let's make sure that whatever um, function that we're created, it's accountable to us as Nigerians in the manner that every democratic system is set up, then we'll see the results. But if we don't do that and we go ahead to create another function, believe me, it will not give us the uh, intention or the objective that we want. Thank you so much, Dr. Kabira Damosio, Beacon Security and Intelligence Media. Thank you for speaking. My pleasure. Thank you so Thank much, you. too. Thank you. <laughs> Oh yeah, that conversation, as exciting as it may be and painful, some of the revelations as they may be, has to end at a point. And this is that point. I want to thank you for letting us be a part of your day. Send us your comment uh, and addresses are right there on your screen. But you can also catch up with this conversation and others that we've had. Just go to channelstv.com forward slash podcast to get started. Also, check us out on YouTube, channels where, and you'll see all our playlists. Newsnight is there. Go watch this conversation again and let's know what you think. But till we bring you another edition of the show, I want to say thank you and have yourself a good rest of the evening.